Constitutional Conversations is a series of discussions by America's leading scholars about the principles, framing, ratification, and implementation of constitutional government in the United States. This series is hosted by the James Madison Memorial Fellowship Foundation of Alexandria, Virginia. Looking at Dolly's words and her work, as well as those of her colleagues, I began to understand um, a dynamic that I call the official sphere and the unofficial sphere. So the official sphere of politics is the one we're most familiar with. I think of it as kind of the product of politics. It's the election, the legislation, the proclamation, the press release, um, and it's usually in official spaces. Even the Rose Garden is considered an official space, but Congress, the president's office. But what's most interesting to me and what Dolly really showed me was the power of the unofficial sphere. And that's about the process of politics. That's the place where the deals are made, where people can propose things that they wouldn't necessarily propose or negotiate um, outside of the glare of the official spotlight. And this unofficial sphere often takes place at social events, at homes, in what we call private spaces. And when you look at this, you understand the sort of dynamic of the official and the unofficial sphere. You see that you need both to have politics. And in fact, what the women of Washington, including Dolly, were doing would later become a profession called lobbyists. So lobbyists are called lobbyists because they did their work outside the official sphere of, the, of Congress. They did it in the lobby. These women are doing it in their own homes and at social events. Now, let me say that this doesn't make Washington unique. The role of social events, of homes, of sociability has a long history in Western culture. And you look at it when you see um, shows about the British royalty or British gentry, you see a lot of work being done by women. In Washington City, though, something happened, something shifted. Because of the commitment to pure republicanism, that theory that abhorred anything monarchical, anything to do with the courts and kings. The founders deliberately constructed a federal government that was very lean. It did not have a big bureaucracy. And they were afraid of the social sphere. They didn't want those big parties that courts had. So there was very little social sphere. There was very little official sphere. So what happened in that vacuum, though, was that the women of Washington, led by Dolly, created that unofficial sphere. And it assumed an even greater uh, importance. If you don't have a place in Congress where you can talk to somebody from across the aisle, and you couldn't do it in Congress, then that drawing room or Dolly's carriage or a tea party assumed a much greater importance. And in the old world, in the colonial America or in Western Europe, men did a lot of this kind of unofficial stuff, but they couldn't do it in Washington. So women assumed a disproportionate, again, I would say, importance in their work. One of the things I really discovered that was happening in what I call the unofficial sphere was patronage. Now patronage is the official definition is the awarding of titles, money, or other goods in return for political favors. Um, I always say, whenever, what, but whatever state I am, I always say, I can't believe I'm explaining patronage to people in fill in the state, but there it is. We all know what it is. But nothing scared the founders more than patronage because it symbolized the court. And they were constructing a new world, not like the old world, with its patronage and its favors and its connection making and all of that stuff. So they were not going to play patronage. Uh, and in fact, if you look at Thomas Jefferson's correspondence, I think he writes about, worriedly about patronage more than any other topic. Of course, there's always something suspicious about people who keep denying that they're doing anything. And patronage might seem corrupt, the kind of rewarding of supporters, but the truth is a government needs a little patronage. You need to be able to reward supporters, and you need to also surround yourself with friends and not enemies. So John Adams did himself a real disservice in order to appear virtuous, and not that he was playing patronage. He took on the cabinet of his uh, predecessor, Washington, and they all hated John Adams. And so he got very little done, and what he did get done wasn't very good uh, in many ways uh, because he didn't actually play patronage. What happens then, because as like nature, politics abhors a vacuum, is that the women of Washington 
began playing patronage. And Dolly Madison has been called the queen of Washington City. She was also the queen of influence peddling. And the women of Washington even developed a language of patronage that disguised what they were doing. So for a long time, I would read these letters between Dolly and, say, Martha Jefferson Randolph, who was Thomas Jefferson's daughter. And they'd seem to be talking about some young man and how worthy he was and how he loved his mother and his sisters and how his sister's health needed a change of scene. And couldn't you get somebody a job? And I, I had to kind of look past that language of, that seemed so personal. And it seemed about love and care and realized this was blatant influence peddling. But Dolly got, she staffed the federal government both in ho at home in Washington City and across the country. So that was really another part of her work that I found quite striking and quite unexpected. Constitutional Conversations is made possible by a generous grant from the Fairley S. Dickinson Jr. Foundation. Constitutional Conversations is made possible by the James Madison Education Fund.